the ocean. It covers seven-tenths of the Earth. In most places, it's more than 3,800 meters deep. It is cold and dark, a world of crushing pressures, deep sea world. The human race has long dreamed of being able to dive into this unknown world, the deep sea. But it is only in the last few decades that we've been able to observe it direct. In March 1995, the unmanned research submersible Kaiko dived to a depth of 10,911 meters in the deepest place in the world, the Mariana Trench. Japanese deep sea research and the technology it depends on are now world class. The Earth's crust is volatile in places where the tectonic plates meet each other. Earthquakes can easily happen here. The Philippine plate pushes under the Eurasian plate, forming a deep trench called the Nankai Trough. Many violent earthquakes have happened on the landward side of the trough. In 1997, Jamstec installed a seafloor monitoring system for submarine earthquakes, 110 kilometers off Moroto Cape in western Japan. Part of this system is located at a depth of 3,572 meters. The observatory images of deep sea animals have been recorded by its video camera over a period of four years. Undersea landslips have contoured the ocean floor. The water temperature is 1.5 degrees Celsius. The pressure is 350 times more than that at the surface. No sunlight penetrates this deep. It's a pitch black world. From the human point of view, the deep sea is a very harsh environment. But there's something special about the Nankai Trough off Moroto, where methane and hydrogen sulfide well up from the seabed, creating what's called a cold seep. This methane and hydrogen sulfide mix is deadly, yet the Visicomyid clam uses it to live. The observation station has one camera. It can pan through 320 degrees and tilt 150 degrees. There are three markers in front of the camera. They're about 40 centimeters high. The distance from the camera to the yellow marker in the center is three meters. The deep sea is pitch black, and the only light comes from the station's lights during filming. Images recorded here, along with earthquake-related data, are transmitted via an optic fibre cable to Jamstex land station at Moroto. The film recording of Deep Sea Life began in March 1997. This fish is called the pudgy cuskeel. It can be found in the deep seas from the temperate zone to the tropics. A great many forms of life have been filmed in this location during four years. Over 70 species have been recorded so far. Seven varieties of fish, 13 types of echinoderm, 16 kinds of anthropod, six kinds of annelid, 15 kinds of mollusk, and eight kinds of cnidarian have all been recorded. This is a variety of eel pout. Here it's probably trying to rid itself of parasites. This is the first time an eel pout has been seen at a depth of 3,572 meters. They've never previously been recorded deeper than 2,700 meters. This is a type of galatheid squat lobster. It's classified among the hermit crabs. It looks as though it's settling in nicely at the observatory site. 
This is a Panaid shrimp. It's developed limbs for swimming. This Caridian shrimp is carrying a shell which is molted from another shrimp. This Panaid shrimp seems to be trying to get the shell the Caridian shrimp is carrying. The deep sea is in a state of absolute darkness, so the creatures here cannot use vision. Instead, they rely on long antennae, which pick up scent and vibration to locate their food. The Panaid shrimp gives up the chase and turns back. Perhaps the scent of the shell the Caridian shrimp was carrying remains. The Panaid shrimp is still feeling around for it with its legs. This is a type of mask crab. The invisible cloak it carries may be a remnant from the days when it inhabited shallower waters. And now a spider crab. Its whole body is covered in short hairs. This is a form of hermit crab, which is occupying the shell of a buccinid snail. And here we can see a kind of copepod, which is around one millimetre in length. And here is a mycid, which is a few millimetres in length. This is a type of bristle worm. The bristle worm is giving off reflections from the light here. This is a sea urchin. This, a kind of brittle star. And this is a type of sea snail. This is a sea anemone. And this is a kind of coral which has a soft body, unlike reef corals. Here we can see a hydroid. Hydroids like this started to attach to the frame of the observatory 17 months after it was installed. What looks like snow in this picture is really dead plankton, an organic waste from living creatures. It's called marine snow. The isopod here is eating some of the organic matter on the seabed. It's an accumulation of marine snow. This galatheid squat lobster is also eating marine snow. Most organic matter on the seabed originates as marine snow, so it's a very important food source for deep-sea creatures. The main source of marine snow is dead phytoplankton, which carry out photosynthesis. Plant life only survives as far down as sunlight penetrates, that is, 200 metres. Even though sunlight itself does not penetrate to the deep sea, the life forms there still depend on it as a source of energy. On the other hand, there are also forms of life, such as this visicomyid clam, which rely for energy on sources of chemicals, such as methane and hydrogen sulphide, which seep out of the earth. The visicomyid clam has almost no identifiable internal organs. Its digestive tract has also degenerated. The red body fluid contains large amounts of haemoglobin, and this haemoglobin transports hydrogen sulphide and oxygen to symbiotic bacteria living in the gills. The bacteria carry out chemosynthesis and produce organic matter using energy from hydrogen sulphide. The clam survives on this organic matter as an energy source. Most deep sea creatures move very slowly. This time-lapse recording is shown at twice the real speed. This galatheid squat lobster is grooming itself with its fifth leg. This lobster is molting. It's the first time this event has been captured on camera. Cracks open up between its abdomen and the carapace on its back while it's excreting new carapace material. It first pulls itself out of its carapace and steadily sloughs off the exoskeleton. By the time the molting process has reached its eyes, it is exposed as far as the third abdominal somite.
toppling sideways, it pulls out its legs, breaks free of the exoskeleton, and throws it away. Even after molting, it can still jump, so if any predators appear, it can escape. Molting completed, it moves away from the discarded shell in repeated jumps. Six hours after molting has finished, a Caridian shrimp appears. It eats the discarded shell for its gelatinous protein. It's a tiny amount of food, but this is still an important food source on the deep sea floor, where food resources are scarce. Despite the value of this food, the Galatheid squat lobster swims off without eating its own shell. We were able to record these lobsters molting three times, in February, September and October 1998. During the molting process, the squat lobster is vulnerable to attack by predators. But even though it didn't attempt to take cover while molting, it didn't get attacked. Carnivorous fish like the abyssal grenadier and rat tail also made appearances at the observation site. The octopus is near the top of the food chain, but it's also known to eat crustaceans and shellfish. This octopus belongs to the Grimpotuthis species. This is the first time that it has been filmed in Japanese waters. It stops at the observatory for 20 minutes and then swims off again. In 800 hours of filming over a period of four years, there were no instances recorded of fish or octopus attacking other living creatures. However, they were observed eating carrion. This is the corpse of a squat lobster. This Caridium shrimp is working flat out to feed on it, but it doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. As soon as the Caridian shrimp goes away, a group of isopods appears. Carrion is a vital food source for deep sea creatures. This isopod looks as though it's carrying some form of food. The filming of this type of behaviour is another first. Sometimes there are tussles for food. The small pink crustacean is a munida, a kind of galatheid lobster. It fights with a caridian shrimp over the food for 20 minutes. During four years of filming, we've learned that the isopod prefers to live in rock crevices. As soon as the Munida lobster starts threatening it with its chelipeds or claws, the isopod runs off. The Munida lobster then goes into a rock crevice. It also likes this environment. A galatheid squat lobster, much bigger than the Munida lobster, moves close. The Munida lobster jumps away to safety. When the squat lobster stops moving, the Munida starts walking. 
and then it returns to its rock crevice two hours later. This Munida lobster lives under a different rock. When a Caridian shrimp approaches, it comes out. It may be defending its home territory by adopting a threatening stance. Up to now, it has been thought that deep-sea creatures do not defend any set domains. But looking at these images, Munida appears to be a territorial species. Even though this galatheid squat lobster signals the Munida lobster to move aside by waving its claws, the Munida lobster stands its ground. A short while earlier, though, a larger galatheid squat lobster had approached, and it ran away. Its reactions vary depending on its opponent. Here we can see the squat lobster waving its claws as if to communicate a message deliberately. Here are two more galatheid squat lobsters. They're having an intense face-off, waving their claws at each other. They've begun grappling, but it doesn't look like a form of mating behaviour. Even if they get rolled over, they immediately grab at each other again. It's thought that they're able to square up to each other in the dark by sensing vibrations from the waving of their claws. In the deep sea, where vision is impossible, the transmission of vibrations is an important means of communication. When deep sea creatures face off, it's usually the smaller one which beats a retreat. Even a retreat is done at a leisurely pace. Because predators are rare on the ocean floor near the observatory, fast movement is apparently unnecessary. During the four-year period, there were observations of threatening behaviour and fights, but never a fight to the death. Since 1997, two individual Visicomaya clams have been recorded twice a day for four years. Because the Visicomyid clam relies on cold seep for nourishment, it's hoped that they can indicate movements in the Earth's crust. Four years after observations began, the Visicomyid clam on the right died. It may be an indication of some change in the cold seep in this area. The Visicomyid clam, which gets its nourishment from bacterial chemosynthesis, is part of a food chain which includes solar-dependent species, like the spiral-shelled snail and galatheid squat lobster. Two different ecosystems interact in the deep sea off Muroto, the photosynthetic and the chemosynthetic. In April and May 2001, the unmanned submersible Kaiko dived down to the observatory, where a survey was undertaken and samples collected. This was to investigate the interaction among deep sea species as parts of a food chain. One hundred and forty-one specimens from six phyla were collected. It was possible to trace the animal's diet through comparing the stable isotope ratios of biogenic carbon and nitrogen in their chemical composition. The omnivorous galatheid squat lobster. The sea cucumber, which feeds on deposits. The fan worm, which feeds on suspended material. And the amphipod, which feeds on carrion. This plot of their carbon and nitrogen stable isotope ratios shows a cluster in the green circle. It demonstrates that even though their food habits may be different, these species still draw their nutrition from the same sources. 
Because of their similar nutritional ranges, they generally do not prey on each other. The deep sea is often thought to be a cold, dark, harsh world. Yet in exchange for inhabiting this tough environment, it seems that the deep sea species minimize the risk of being attacked and enjoy a relatively high degree of security. Three thousand five hundred and seventy two meters under the sea. Here we have an observatory, a window into a world as yet unknown the deep sea.